Hi, my name is Evan, and welcome to Fearless Passport. Do you know that indoor air is five times more polluted than the outdoor air? When allergens and floating particles PM2.5 is inhaled, pollutants enter to the body through nose and mouth to the lung. The smallest particles that enter into the lung will diffuse into the bloodstream where they are transported to all organs of the body and therefore can affect normal immune systems and brain functions. If you want an air purifier that can filter more than 300 types of allergens and airborne COVID-19 virus, please look for Atmosphere Sky, the only air treatment product that is tested and proven by Allergy UK, the solutions for nose sensitivity and family protections from airborne viruses. Atmosphere Sky comes with the smallest filter size of 0.0024 microns and this is my pre-filter of Atmosphere Sky only after 3 months of using. Click on the WhatsApp link on the description box for more information. And now let us jump straight into the part 2 of Lanfang Republic. In the last video, part 1 of Lanfang history, we have covered the history of Lanfang Republic, our hero in the history Luo Fang Bo, and also the peak time of the first ever lost nations in Asia. In this part 2, we will talk about the dying of Lanfang and where did the descendants of Lanfang escape to? Did they escape to Singapore just like everyone thought that Lee Kuan Yew is the descendants of Lanfang Republic? So without further ado, let's jump straight into it. The Lanfang general systems continued until the fifth generation when the Dutch East India Company had increased its power in Pontianak. So how the Dutch gained power is very simple. They implemented the typical alienation method and oppressions to the gold mining companies until there were internal warfare breaking out. So here's the turning point for the Lanfang Republic. The fifth leader of Lanfang, Liu Tai E, kinda turned his back on his allies to help the Dutch people. So for example, Lanfang helped the Dutch in attacking the largest mining company, Da Gang, and captured the leader of Da Gang Company to hand it over to the Dutch for disposal. The Da Gang Company was defeated by the Dutch army after a major blow. So observing such changes in power, many of the mining companies moved along the mountains to Sarawak border. The first group of immigrants in Sarawak was the miners from Sambas and most of them are the Jiaying Hakka people and at the same time, the He Po Hakka miners arrived in Simangang and Angelili to form the Shu Wufen Gong Si 15 shares company. So far, more than 10 gold mining companies have been wiped out by the Dutch army. And Lanfang Company was the last to survive because the 10th leader, Liu Asheng, he signed a secret treaty of non-aggression with the Dutch. But guess what? After the death of Liu Asheng, the Dutch just took over the Lanfang Republic and the rule of mining companies is officially ended. After Lanfang Company was destroyed by the Dutch, the descendants of the company initiated a revolt against the Dutch and this led to the famous Mando Rebellion, Gong Tou Pan Luan, also called the Third Gong Si War, which is an uprising of the ethnic Chinese held by the Dayak to against the Dutch East in this government. The Montrado's last stance was during the month of May in 1853, when the Dutch military command finally conquered Sambas, Mampawa and Pontianak and whoever who helped the rebels to give salt, opium and rice and other foodstuff would be punished. The defense of Lanfang and local Dutch people were failed due to the poor weapons. In the following 10 years, the other small Malay kingdoms of West Kalimantan were all eliminated by the Dutch one by one and only the Pontianak Sultan was kept as a political puppet. As I read so many resources and have personally talked to the direct descendants from West Kalimantan and Sarawak, they have made it very clear to me that Lee Kuan Yew is not a descendant from Lanfang Republic. I know there are many resources from the internet that mentions Lanfang descendants has escaped to Sumatra and Singapore. In fact, not many Lanfang descendants had actually escaped out from West Kalimantan. The truth is, many Lanfang Chinese descendants remained in the regions because West Kalimantan remained as one of the most populated areas for Tionghoa Indonesian, especially in Pontianak and Singkawang. 
The Dutch influence in West Kalimantan remained rather minimum as there are not many Dutch or European influence buildings that you can see compared to the Jawa Sea and Sumatra regions. Today, if you happen to go to Kuching or Bao in Sarawak, there's a temple in Lundu where the local Hakka people still worship to Luofang Bo. Remember in the first place, in part 1, we mentioned that one of the leader Liu Sanbang from San Tiao Gou Company leading 4,000 miners to settle in Bao, Sarawak after defeated by the larger Takang company. And Bao is just a mountain road away from West Kalimantan to Sarawak. So when they cross the mountains, or we can say they were crossing the border, they are re-establishing their new company as Shifen, the 12th branch company. They were the first batch of Sarawak Chinese settlers who had migrated from the neighboring land, which belongs to Indonesia. Back then, Bao was known as Mao San, follow the headship mountain of Gunung Krian. The abundance of gold and antimony at Mao San drew more and more Chinese miners from Sambas and Langau Ledo in Indonesia to the town. At that time, the two most valuable resources were the gold and opium trade. The area of Mao San eventually prospered through fantastic gold, Chinese liquor and opium trading. Over the time, Mao San has expanded to a self-sufficient and self-governing town. The history continued to the conflict between the 12th Shares Company and our famous White Raja, Raja James Brooke. Sarawak at the time were under the ruling of Brunei Sultanate, and it was a place troubled with local rebels and illegal pirates. The Sultan of Brunei promised Brooke the land of Sarawak come with the fancy title of White Raja which means white governor of Sarawak in exchange of Brooke's expertise in suppressing rebellion. At first, Brooke was in peace with the Chinese mining company. He was too busy to deal with the local riots, such as Shari Masaho and Rentap. But a good time doesn't last long. After settling all of the local riots, Brooke started to impose a hate tax Renho Sui on the miners, as well as prohibited the trade of opium and Chinese liquor. Worst of all, he banned the free export and trading of gold. The 12th shares company leader, Liu Sanpang, refused to pay tax to the Raja. So Raja was constantly finding fault in his administrations and labelled him as a rebel. As the company has more conflict with the Brook government, in 1856, the mining company was once again arrested and fined due to an opium smuggling incident and a scandal. Triggered by Brooke's oppressive policies, the 12th Shares Gongsi leader Liu Sanbang led 600 angry miners to Brooke Palace, Astana in Kuching, with one simple goal in mind that is to kill James Brooke, capture Kuching and then set up their government in Sarawak. They marched from Mao San to Sarawak River and travelled by boats to Kuching where they burned down the Astana and town in the midnight. Here they made the mistake. One of the Brooks officers were beheaded and were mistook as James Brook himself. In fact, James Brook dived into the Kuching River and successfully escaped from the assassinations with the help of a Malay official. But none of this was known to the miners. After three days of occupation in Kuching, as Liu Sanbang decided to head back to Mao San, the team was unfortunately attacked by the Brooks, Malay and Dayak troops on their way back. Liu Sanbang and 108 of his men were shot dead while the rest, outnumbered and injured, retreated to Mao San. And Brooks' attack didn't just stop here. They continued to slaughter the innocents, women and children. Piles of dead bodies were left unburied and since the corpse were rotten, the smell was so unpleasant and that's how Mao San got its name of Bao. In Malay, Bao simply means smelly. As for the rest of miners and their families who refuge in the cave near the town, the Iban warriors stacked wood at the narrow entrance of the cave to smoke out its occupants. All of them, the innocents, the women and children died alive from smoking. And that's how the cave got its name as Gua Hantu, the ghost cave. That's how the 12 shares company completely disappeared from the history. Approximately 3,500 Bao Chinese were either killed or driven out of Sarawak. After this, there were several waves of Chinese migrations to Sarawak and the largest wave was in conjunctions of the fall of Qing dynasties where most of the laborers were sold to Nanyang as coolies. 
Without the questions, the major cause that pushed the Chinese pioneers to go to Borneo were the dire economic situations back home and the quest for adventure and material gains. And in every man, in principle, they had a family back home to support and to return to. The idea was to go to Borneo to make a fortune and then leave, but in fact, most of them remained to build a Chinese society. They no longer had any place in the society of their home country. And I hope you enjoyed today's video. The history of Lanfang Republic is actually really, really long. Special thanks to Dr. Lam Chi Kyung for his book talking about Sarawak Chinese and special appreciations to Azula, one of my YouTube audience, who gave me a lot more information as a Lanfang descendant from Ankalili. Based on her original words, her great-grandfather was one of the miners from 15 shares company and they had won the battle with the Dutch East India Company because they imported cannons from China. When the Dutch lost the battle, they threatened to come back with more advanced cannons made by the British. The entrance gate was sealed by the Dutch army and the only way out was through the back of the gold mines where Sarawak is at the other side of the mountains. And that is how the miners escaped through the land route and built a new life in Sarawak. This is a photo of an old temple in Ankalili with hundreds of gold miners named on the wall. And this is where the gold miners met and made decisions about their work at the gold mine. Not to mention in Nitang Discord community admin who helped to proofread my scripts in giving the right information about Lanfang Republic. And if you are interested in the complete history of Lanfang, please refer to this website down below. I spent so much time writing and editing this video. And this is the longest video that I've made. I would really appreciate if you look into Atmosphere Sky, the most reliable air treatment products that functions as your extended lung to get rid 99.99 airborne allergens and virus. Click on the WhatsApp link below for trade-in price and also demo. Please share this video to three of your WhatsApp group and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.